Welcome, everyone. We're excited to have you join us today for our webinar. I'm Megan Weber. I am an aquatic invasive species extension educator here at the University of Minnesota, um, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Um, today, we're inviting Chelsea Blanke um, and Julia Bonin to talk about their work um, around Phragmites in Minnesota. And today is, I think, especially exciting because I was just pulling up the last time that we invited this team on for a webinar, and they were actually our very first. And when I pulled it up, I saw that to the very day on May 22nd of 2019, we hosted the very first webinar in this series. So exactly five years later to the day, we get to welcome them back. And I think that's just super exciting. So Chelsea and Julia, we're so happy to have you here. Um, a couple of housekeeping items before I turn it over. Um, we have a tool called Slido that we're using for questions and answers. So you can go to slido.com and you enter the event code FRAG and it'll allow you to answer or put in questions that you have there. You can also upvote other people's questions. You can put questions in at any point throughout the webinar, but we're going to hold them to the end. So um, for the second half, we'll have a Q&A portion with Julia and Chelsea. Um, we are also recording. So this will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, it usually takes a week or so for us to get it closed captioned and up, but we'll send out a notice when that's there in case there's anything you want to come back and review or something you wanted to share with a friend or colleague. Um, and we do have everyone muted for the duration. So if you have questions or having issues, um, go ahead and use chat and we can help you there. And if you have questions for Chelsea and Julia, um, go ahead and put those in Slido. So um, I think that's all that I have for you. So Chelsea, I'm just gonna turn it direct over to you to get started on your portion. So thanks everyone so much for being here to learn about the state of non-native Phragmites management in Minnesota. Um, my name is Chelsea Blanke. I'm a researcher here at the University of Minnesota, and I work closely with Julia Bonin and Dan Larkin on other projects related to invasive species and ecological restoration, as well as the Phragmites project. Um, so you may or may not know that we are now a few years into a statewide coordinated effort to control invasive Phragmites in Minnesota. Uh, and the story of this management um, approach has, to date has been kind of a unique one as far as invasive species management goes. And it's a, an exciting example of the power of partnerships and timely application of ecological research. It's also kind of a complex story with many interwoven threads. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through those in the next 30 minutes or so, explaining how we got here and ending with a look toward the future. So I'm gonna start with a story of how this effort began, just documenting where non-native Phragmites is located in the state, uh, using that data to work with regulators to get a jump on this non-native non invasive species before it really got out of control. Uh, second, I will detail the statewide control effort and what it looks like. And then I want to talk a little bit about what we see as the vision for the future of this effort. And at the end, um, Julia and I will should have plenty of time to answer your questions. Um, before I go any further, uh, we should talk a little bit about non-native Phragmites, what it is, and why it can be a problem. So non-native Phragmites is a very tall non-native grass that can really take over wetlands and lakeshores and outcompete native species. We often see it along roadsides and in stormwater ponds um, as well. And it's actually a subspecies, uh, Phragmites australis, subspecies australis is what we're talking about here today. Uh, this non-native subspecies originated in Europe uh, and its common name is simply common reed, which isn't particularly descriptive or specific. Um, so we just refer to it by its scientific name of Phragmites. Uh, what are some of its impacts? Uh, I mentioned it's tall. This grass can grow up to 18 feet. Uh, it tends to form very dense stands that are impassable to wildlife and people. It outcompetes native vegetation, including wildlife uh, reducing wildlife habitat and could block sight lines along roadsides if left unchecked. Um, it's so good at transpiration or taking up water that it can actually dewater and effectively really transform wetlands. 
Um, unfortunately, native uh, non-native Phragmites is really widespread in other parts of the country, like eastern Wisconsin, Michigan, Nebraska, for example. So when Dan, Julia, and Sue Galatowicz, who was deeply involved in the earlier days of the effort in Minnesota, uh, when they started seeing non-native Phragmites along roadsides here, they knew we had a window of opportunity to get ahead of it and prevent it from taking over here. Uh, so in 2017, while the scale of non-native Phragmites invasion was still relatively small, the team here at the U led an effort to crowdsource reporting of locations of non-native Phragmites in the landscape to get a sense of just what we were really dealing with with its distribution in Minnesota. And the team worked with partners to develop an identification guide and sent it out to their networks of natural resource professionals around the state asking them to keep an eye out for it, uh, report locations in EDMAPs, and send in samples for verification and genetic testing. Um, so we use EDMAPs, the EDMAPs website, as our database for maintaining records of Phragmites populations. Uh, very important, and I haven't mentioned it yet, but very importantly, there is a native subspecies of Phragmites in Minnesota that is a natural part of our wetlands. Uh, it looks pretty similar to the non-native subspecies at a glance. So at this stage, it was really critical to know if these two subspecies could be visually and physically distinguished. Um, so I wanna do a quick poll now to keep you all on your toes. Uh, I wanna know how confident are you in your ability to distinguish between native and non-native Phragmites? So um, I actually have, two, it looks like we have two polls here and that's fine, we can just do both at once. So I also was interested in knowing uh, how familiar you are with the statewide control effort in Minnesota um, before uh, this webinar was announced. So go ahead and take a minute to just indicate how confident you are in identifying invasive Phragmites and also just how familiar you are with uh, the control effort here in Minnesota. So for the first question, maybe you are feel like you're kind of an expert, uh, possibly. Maybe you kind of know what to look for, but kind of would like a, a second opinion from an expert. Um, and maybe there's some of you that kind of have no idea what characteristics to look at. Um, and similarly with the, the control effort, um, maybe the the webinar announcement was the first time you had heard of this. Um, and some of you probably on this call are, you know, intimately involved. So I'm sure there's a range there. I'm just curious to see where y'all are at. All right, cool. So um, on this uh, identification question, it looks like um, there are a lot of folks that um, We'll learn some things today about how to identify um, and distinguish those two Phragmites subspecies. Um, and so as we have a few experts on as well, so that's exciting. Um, and yeah, I guess I the second poll kind of matches what I feel like I see in that I feel like a lot of folks, uh, even natural resource professionals, um, are not super familiar with this effort. So really Glad to be able to get the word out today and um, hope that y'all learn something here as well. So here are some of those key characteristics to look for in distinguishing between the two subspecies. Say you're driving along or you're out at a park or a wilderness area somewhere or you're on your boat looking at the shoreline and you see something suspicious. Um, we hope that you'll go check it out if it's safe to do so, because the best characteristics to use need to be observed up close. Um, and you can take pictures of these and send them to us for verification. So the first characteristic I will talk about is the leaf sheath. So you can see that in the non-native Phragmites on the left, 
uh, that leaf sheath is really tightly adhering to the stem. And as opposed to in the non-native on the right, it tends to be more loosely attached to the stem. And another thing that you can look for with this is um, on the lower stems in the, in the native Phragmites, there'll be um, often more of a gap between the leaf sheaths as well. In uh, next thing you can look at is just the stem texture and color. In non-native Phragmites, if you roll your fingers around the stem, not the leaf sheath, but the actual stem, so you might have to pull that away to um, get to the actual stem. And on the stem, you'll feel ridges. So it has a ridged stem, whereas the native Phragmites tends to have a very smooth, glossy and often red stem. Um, I wouldn't suggest using color alone because the non-native Phragmites can appear to have a reddish stem too. Um, and those three characteristics, so the leaf sheath, uh, texture and color of the stem are best used from about midsummer through the winter. Another helpful characteristic you can look for is if you pull the leaf sheath away from the stem, you can look at the ligule, which is this kind of fleshy appendage between the inner leaf and leaf sheath. Uh, you can see here that on the non-native Phragmites, which is on the right, the ligule looks like a very thin, discrete brown line, kind of like it's drawn with an ultra fine point marker. Uh, and in native Phragmites, this tissue is thicker, more like a smudgy pencil line. So you'll want to use three to four of these different characteristics for a solid ID. The most reliable characters are going to be that leaf sheath adherence, um, the texture and color of the stem, and the ligule. Uh, things like the density and height of the population or the stand of an uh, Phragmites, um, bushiness of the inflorescence or the flower head, and whether that flower head is standing up straight or sort of leaning downward are less reliable on their own for ID, but they can be helpful in addition to those others and for just noting patches for further investigation. Uh, coloration can also be helpful at certain times of year. Non-native Phragmites will stay green even after a frost, so it doesn't get fall color like native Phragmites does. I encourage you to refer to our ID guide for more detail. We have a printable version of it on our website that you can take with you in your travels. Um, so you can visit just punch in minfrag.org and there are buttons, and you'll see there's a button for identifying and reporting invasive Phragmites. So that'll take you to that ID guide and all of the different characteristics. Um, we also do keep track of native Phragmites populations that have been reported to us, and you can find those um, on this map on our website as well. So now that we have identification out of the way, back to our story here. So the team put out the ID guide to a large network of folks in Minnesota, asking them to keep an eye out for non-native Phragmites, report it, and send in samples. So some of those samples were set up, sent off for genetic testing. Um, and from that, the team was able to determine that the non-native subspecies can, in fact, be accurately distinguished by the average manager using the characteristics we just talked about. So this, of course, was good news to know that genetic testing of every Phragmite stand wouldn't be needed, um, which would have been, of course, a real barrier to any management effort. Um, we determined that the visual and physical characteristics are sufficient for identification. And um, that crowdsource reporting effort painted the first picture of non-native Phragmites distribution in the state. So by around 2018, around 400 populations had been documented statewide. 
Uh, I moved to Minnesota at that time and came in to sort of summarize what had been learned and assess and communicate how the state might move forward with a strategic coordinated control effort. Um, and we developed a summary report in 2019. And so with this assessment report in hand, we began work with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Agriculture on the need for regulating non-native Phragmites and what a statewide control effort could look like. Um, so that was about the last time our team spoke on this topic at one of uh, Extension's AIS webinars. Um, and that kind of takes us to the conclusion of this part of the story about sort of the non-native Phragmites exploration phase and into the phase of control. So now I'll talk about this control effort that is solidly underway, um, how it works, all the different pieces and the results that we're seeing. So some key components of the control effort are regulation, control, monitoring, and wastewater treatment facilities. So I'll touch on each one of these components. Uh, starting with regulation, in 2019, when that assessment report was finalized, Non-native Phragmites wasn't regulated in Minnesota. Um, invasive species are often regulated by state agencies to help prevent their spread. Uh, following communication to the Department of Natural Resources and the Department of Agriculture, both agencies began working toward regulation. Um, and now native Phragmites is regulated by both agencies. Uh, so those regulations are important because they prohibit the possession importation, purchase, sale, propagation, transportation, and introduction of non-native Phragmites. And they require efforts to be made to prevent seed development and dispersal into new areas. So having those regulations is really helpful for being able to communicate the severity of the subspecies and the risks that it poses. Um, a lot of non-native Phragmites populations are on private property, so when coordinating control, we need to communicate with the landowners and having that regulatory status really helps in educating them. And we offer essentially to take care of the issue so that they don't have to. So that is the regulation piece. Um, so now what does the, the actual control of non-native Phragmites look like? Uh, we got together with DNR and began imagining this as well, and Wendy Crowell at DNR in particular has been a critical contributor to the non-native Phragmites control effort. Uh, she advocated for applying for funds through the Great Lakes Restor Restoration Initiative to support centralized statewide control. And since 2019, GLRI funds have supported contracts for control of non-native Phragmites in Minnesota. Julia, Wendy, and I work closely together with many local partners to coordinate control. So I want to highlight that we have a handful of local partners that have been really instrumental. Uh, we have this, so we have the statewide contract that is uh, a contractor hired annually to go around the state and conduct control. And we also have partnerships with local professionals who either take on control of populations in the area, in their areas themselves, or manage their own contracts. Uh, in the Duluth Superior area, there's been, uh, there's a team composed of multiple members of different organizations, including Community Action Duluth, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, Fond du Lac Band, 1854 Treaty Authority, the Minnesota and Wisconsin DNRs and others. And that team began controlling non-native Phragmites starting in 2017. So before the statewide effort really got going um, and their efforts really have been quite successful in that area. Um, we also continue to coordinate with them as well as other county and local partners in Ramsey, Anoka, Chisago, Wright, Carver and Hennepin counties, just to name a few, as well as many others. Uh, and MnDOT has also been a really key partner in this effort as they've been managing non-native Phragmites along their right-of-ways. 
what control methods are we using? Uh, we recommend using imazapir and or glyphosate uh, just once a year in the late summer, early fall, when non-native Phragmites is dedicating its energy down into the roots. Uh, in the early stages of this effort, our team conducted a literature review and determined this to be the most effective method. And we're seeing really exciting results with this approach, and I'll get back to that in just a little bit. Um, ideally, we would also recommend uh, knocking down the dead standing stems in between treatments to facilitate. Um, so a couple of years of treatment is expected to be needed to eliminate a stand. And so knocking down the, the dead stems essentially just helps uh, the future treatments uh, reach the plants so that uh, they, those can be more effective. Um, we haven't, it's, it's difficult to have enough funding to be able to do that on every population, but that is something that um, we recommend as well. Uh, for So for more information about this, just our control approach, you can again check out minfrag.org and visit the management recommendations page. Another really key piece of the statewide non-native Phragmites control effort is monitoring. Uh, so monitoring can sometimes be lacking in invasive species management programs, but thanks largely to the work of conservation core crews hired by the DNR, uh, we actually know how a lot of these populations are responding to the treatments. Each year, uh, we've been fortunate to have dedicated crew members to visit and assess treated non-native patches. Um, so they determine whether the patch has been eliminated or is still present. They estimate the size and density of the patch and note any non-target damage or other disturbances at the site and the crews record their observations as revisits in EDMAPS. And the last final piece of the control effort that I want to talk about is a bit of a subplot in the story, and it has to do with wastewater treatment facilities. So I mentioned how efficient non-native Phragmites is at taking up water. Uh, it's so efficient that it's actually used in some wastewater treatment facilities as a method to dewater biosolids. Uh, in 2019, there were 16 wastewater treatment facilities using non-native Phragmites in their biosolids beds. Uh, at that time, we began working with them and with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency to share the risks posed by non-native Phragmites. Uh, unsurprisingly, many of the populations we see on the landscape are clustered around those facilities. Uh, we work with the Pollution Control Agency and the DNR to develop best practices for the facilities to follow to prevent further spread, like conducting periodic surveys around the facilities, um, managing escapes, and cutting or burning to prevent seed spread. Uh, so in the last five years or so, many of the facilities have transitioned away from non-native Phragmites to other approaches and technologies. And there's, so there are eight facilities in Minnesota now still using non-native Phragmites in their operations. Um, making the transition to new wastewater treatment facility infrastructure can be challenging and very expensive. So when non-native Phragmites became regulated under the state's noxious weed law, an exemption was included for established reed beds um, following, if, as long as they're following best management practices and with the expectation that once viable alternatives are available, they would work to phase out the non-native Phragmites. Uh, Julia has been leading research on additional alternatives, uh, particularly alternative plant species that could be used at these facilities and in the reed beds. Um, and we also worked with Walid Sadox lab to investigate water uptake rates and compare them uh, between native and non-native Phragmites to try to determine if, frag if native Phragmites could be a good alternative. Uh, and there's a grower now also in the top right here uh, in Shatek, Wisconsin, who is actually actively working on providing plugs of native Phragmites that could be used in the facility's reed beds. 
So a lot of progress is being made on this issue of wastewater treatment facilities as a source of spread as well. So now let's wrap up this summary of the control effort with a look at the results. So what are we seeing so far? The number of verified non-native Phragmites populations in Minnesota is approaching 2,000. Um, you'll see there's a hot spot here around the greater Twin Cities metro area and pushing northeast into Chisago County. Uh, so just under 80% of populations statewide are located in the metro. Um, so you'll note that number of populations has increased since 2019. Um, and that's largely, we think, because we're looking and we have more eyes on the ground. So it's a good thing uh, we're continuing to find and document it. And it's still a manageable number. Uh, and guess what? Uh, approximately two thirds of these are smaller in area than a tennis court. And around half of them don't even cover 500 square feet. So the, the smaller these populations are, the easier they are to effectively treat. Um, we're actually talking about only roughly a few hundred acres total statewide. Uh, many of the populations are also very close to one another. So that also facilitates ease of management. Uh, we, we mark every individual patch, even though, even if they're very close together, um, so that they aren't missed by the applicators. Uh, most encouragingly, we're seeing around a quarter of populations that have been treated are no longer present. So that really suggests that the treatments are working. Um, and it's important to note here that this number is just for populations that have been treated at least once. So it's expected that a few years of effectively timed treatment will be needed to eliminate a patch, especially the larger ones. Uh, we're dealing with kind of a moving target where not all of these populations have received the prescribed number of two to three treatments because we keep detecting new populations so that some that number of populations being eliminated is likely to increase as the prescribed number of treatments is um, implemented for each individual population. So we've made a lot of progress from recognizing this problem, documenting the distribution, to regulation and control. Um, and the partners involved in this have made a lot of progress and really maintained momentum. And now we just need to keep it up. So I'm going to close with a vision for the future. And it's one of persistence. I have done a lot of work on invasive species and really see the story as a hopeful example of how applying the best available science in partnership with state and local partners on the ground can make a difference. Um, it's been kind of an ambitious collaborative effort and we're seeing good results. Now we just need some persistence to maintain the ground that has been gained so far. Um, we just need to keep it up. Um, if we don't, we will have really missed a major opportunity to protect Minnesota habitats and infrastructure. So we need to make sure that we keep looking out for new populations. Uh, we need to continue to execute the prescribed couple of years of treatment for each population that's out there. Uh, we need to see what happens in the next few years and keep up our local connections and monitoring the results. Um, and if we do, we still think it's feasible to reverse the spread of non-native Phragmites in greater Minnesota and to continue to eliminate populations and decrease the potential for spread in the Twin Cities metro area. We also need to keep making use of the best available science. Uh, we actually just started a new collaboration this year with Joe Knight's team in the U's Department of Forest Resources. Um, so we'll be exploring in that project the potential to use remote sensing methods for detection and monitoring non-native Phragmites, non Phragmites on the landscape. Uh, and really importantly, we need to work toward implementing restoration of some of these sites. Uh, Revegetation has been shown to provide resistance to reinvasion of non-native Phragmites. 
So this is going to be particularly important where large non-native patches have occurred. Um, control efforts just simply can't be considered successful if managed sites are left vulnerable to reinvasion by Phragmates or other invasive species. Um, there's also sites at risk of erosion and wetland sites where there are dense, dead standing stems that could benefit from removal and restoration to restore wildlife habitat and other ecosystem services. So last, I want to close with how many of you might be able to help and be a part of this effort as well. Uh, first, just please keep an eye out for non-native Phragmites. Um, check out the ID guide on minfrag.org. Uh, it'll show you kind of what to look for and how to report suspected new populations. Um, of course, we really need to be careful that we aren't accidentally treating native Phragmites. Uh, second, avoid spreading this species at all costs, please. Um, it didn't, I didn't really dive into the biology of the plant too much, um, but it can spread from all parts of the plant. So stem fragments, rhizomes, stolons, and seeds. Uh, mowing, for example, is a likely source of spread along roadsides, so it shouldn't be mowed without some serious care and cleaning after the fact. Um, and lastly, if you are taking on treatments of non-native phragmites, Please be sure to follow the management recommendations on our website. Uh, still report those populations and control methods you're using so we can continue to keep track of progress in the statewide effort. Uh, and with that, I just want to really thank again all the many, many partners involved in all this. I almost, I almost broke PowerPoint with this uh, acknowledgement slide. And with that, uh, Julia and I are happy to answer any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Chelsea. I'm just going to um, take over screen sharing quickly so that everyone can get back to our Q&A platform. Um, so here it is again. You can join us for the Q&A portion. Um, you can either take out a phone or a tablet and scan that little QR code and it'll bring you right there or you can open up a tab um, in your internet browser and go to slido.com and enter FRAG as the event code. It'll give you the opportunity there to upvote questions. You can see what other people are asking and we can um, hopefully move the most pressing ones up to the top and get those asked first. Um, if you are struggling with that tool, don't worry, go ahead and put them in chat. And Michelle is sitting behind and waiting and has been um, moving things over to Slido so that they don't get lost um, between the, the two platforms. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'll leave the screen up for a little bit and then um, I'll shut it off, but we have the link and the code in chat and it also shows, it should be showing at least in the background behind us now. So um, to kick things off for Chelsea and Julia, um, the first question up at the top was wondering if native and non-native frag species can hybridize with each other. You want to take that one, Julia? <laughs> sure, I can do that. Yeah, we, we've done some sampling and we've done different levels of um, genetic testing on it. And at one level, we did find that um, there were purported hybrids in Minnesota. But I questioned where those hybrids were because some of them were in far-flung random places. And so we've redone that work and we think that there is some evidence that maybe we had some contamination. So the jury is still out, but we think it's possible we have some, but hopefully not as many as we were kind of finding, which still was a pretty small number, but we hope it's even smaller. And we'll update you as we have um, more information about that. Great. Okay, um, next question was wondering about, oh, uh, labeling on the slides. They wonder if, we, if you could label native versus non-native on the slides to tell better. Um, I think we can probably handle that in some post-production editing um, when we take a look while we're doing the closed captioning. So um, we should be able to do that. Watch the recording and we'll we'll try and have something on there for you. Okay, next one for Chelsea and Julia. Um, what native species are the most successful in out-competing non-native Phragmites? Yeah, um, interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Well, you want do you have a, a stab for that one? I, I mean, I, I guess I was gonna say it. I we have. I feel like I haven't really seen that much. Um, I know that you were doing work at the wastewater treatment facilities on, you know, more candidates that would be good at the 
de dewatering um, the bile solids. But um, yeah, have you seen in, out, out at sites a lot of something kind of actually doing a good job of fending it off? Or <laughs> Yeah, what we think will happen at a lot of the sites, a lot of the sites are roadside sites, as Chelsea mentioned. And we think that the plants that, you know, were there to begin with. So a lot of times it was brome, um, you know, in some of the drier roadside sites. And a lot of times it was invasive cattails in some of the wetter roadside sites and including in a lot of the wetlands that it has invaded. And I think that, you know, it's likely that the brome will fill back in or the invasive cattails will fill back in. We've seen some instances where weedy species like um, Canada thistle has filled in and other annual weed species. That's not desirable, but in some of the spaces where it's going to be invasive cattails anyway, we're not going to force native plants in there just to have them overwhelmed by invasive cattails. Um, but we do think things like bulrush, um, river bulrush, um, soft stem bulrush, um, there's a lot, there's some flowering species that would be adept at filling in the space. We've actually developed a, a seed mix that we think it has only about 20 species in it, but we think they're the kind of workhorse species that are pretty common in some of um, Bowser's seed mixes. And so we've kind of selectively chosen from those for species that we think would be suitable to kind of provide dense competition in these spaces where we've eliminated Phragmites. And we can probably post that online at some point. We haven't tested it yet. That's our one of our projects upcoming. Um, is see if we get funding to test revegetation, seed mixes, and methods. All right. Next question for you is wondering if waterfowl are a potential vector for moving seeds to new areas. I don't it, really think so. Yeah, it's more of a windblown dis dispersal of the seeds, so not likely. Okay, next one was a question about the funding and wondering if that's something that's available direct from you or does it come from the state if someone were to find a new population and wanted to do management? Yeah, so um, in some years, it kind of depends on what our budget looks like. So the control effort is funded through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and it's been a little bit of a different um, amount of funding available across different years. Um, so there were times where uh, we had sort of joint powers agreements with local partners where um, our, so the DNR gets the funds from the GLRI and then they would kind of subcontract with the uh, local partners. Um, and that would kind of help take some of the, you know, it's a lot of work to go out and have a single contractor go out and do all of the control statewide. So um, you know, there have been years where there was enough funding to go around that it made sense to have um, some of those like subcontracts that were more localized um, and sort of share the share the work that way. Um, but it kind of depends on just year to year. It's always a little bit different. So we haven't and we don't necessarily think we're going to be able to do that this year. Um, so stay tuned and don't don't hesitate to reach out. Um, for sure, so. I would note too that the, the counties often have access um, to different funding from MDA, for example, and other sources of funding to uh, manage invasive species. So some of them are taking that on with their own internal funds. Yeah, and that just makes the, the whole effort go further, right? Just um, taking, kind of being able to make use of different uh, different pots and things like that, so. Right, even more to add to the partnerships, right? Right. Yes. Okay, um, next question was wondering about if Minnesota's participated in the Great Lakes Phragmites Collaborative and if the mon if your monitoring data follows the PMAF protocol. Yeah, we have been, we're aware of the, we're kind of, we're aware and we kind of keep up with the Great Lakes Phragmites, Phragmites Collaborative. Um, we have not, uh, fully implemented or integrated with the, the Phragmites Adaptive Management Framework um, because there are just so many populations and it's it's a challenge to do all the reporting associated with that um, as part of the reason. Um, so 
we haven't really integrated with that, but we are aware of that effort. Um, anything you want to add on that, Julia? Yeah, I would just say, you know, because we're kind of in a unique situation, too, where we have a lot of smaller populations, we don't have the large expansive populations. So their model for management doesn't really fit with the protocols that we're using in the in the partnerships that we're trying to implement. Okay, jumping back to some biology questions here. Um, how long do seeds persist at an infestation site? We don't really know that for sure. It was thought, and there's something, I think it's published actually, that somebody thought that the seeds are annual. So that means that the crop of seeds that fall in the winter would not be viable, you know, late fall, winter would not be viable by the following year. But um, I didn't see any good evidence to that effect. So that's something that we'd be interested in testing. And um, we've considered if we might be able to do like a seed burial study for that, but nobody wants to clean invasive Phragmites seed for us because then they'll have that in their seed supply. So kind of risky to even test it. We haven't figured out how to clean the seed without causing more harm. Okay, and then the next question for me, if you can talk about the effectiveness of fire in management of invasive phragmites. Yeah. Uh, it's so, not a control method. Go ahead, Chelsea. Yeah, so um, we, we've we talked about this um, and I guess the, you know, one thing that might be useful for is, again, moving, removing the dead standing stems, um, again, to just facilitate the herbicide treatment. Uh, but obviously burns come with challenges um, and that would be a pretty, just very, that'd be a lot of fuel for a fire. Um, so we haven't, um, it's not that we're discouraging burning, I guess, but um it's just a very kind of a situation specific, case specific kind of situation where you might want to do that. Yeah, it doesn't actually control phragmites. It's a good tool to facilitate an herbicide treatment, but it's not in and of itself control. Got it. Okay. Um, so if someone found a stand and they had suspected hybridization there, um, are they able to send samples to you for an identification? Yes. Well, and actually, I should say, um, I should say no. Um, right now, um, because it's a regulated species and I currently do not have a permit, I could get a permit to um, transport invasive phragmites, but we'd need to have a permit. And in the past, I have had a permit and I could easily renew it, but we don't currently have one. And so because it's illegal to actually move it, please don't move it. Um, one thing that we can do is we can, depending on where it is, we could come see it or we could get the permit or you can take a lot of photos, uh, really detailed photos, and we can look at it via the photos and see if we would need to follow up in person one way or another. So the way to start with that would be to um, submit photos for photo identification. And then if it was a little bit um, goofy looking, we might decide we want to come out and see it in person or have a sample ship to us. Great. And I do, when we do a wrap up, I, I think Chelsea, I have your email showing for folks to, to reach out if they have further questions or want to do some verification of something that they've seen as well. Awesome. Great. Um, yeah. Do we have like a standing, Julia, like um, connection with the the lab that was doing the genetic testing, if we did want to do that. Again. It's easy enough to do that. Yeah. Um, they can be sent down to Whitewater um, to Nick down there. Cool. Good to know. I wasn't sure if that was just a project, you know, specific project that was. No, he, he has okay. um, for the the native frag mighty production in Wisconsin, they submitted samples to be sure that they're actually producing, you know, because they collected the seed locally in Wisconsin so that they submitted samples to be sure that they're um, processing and collecting native Phragmites. And he was able to very quickly um, do a test for them. Great. Okay. Um, do you think drone mapping might be helpful for long-term Phragmites, maybe management or control? Yeah, so we're, I mentioned that we're uh, doing, uh, we're just starting a project with a lab that does a lot of work in remote sensing. Um, so 
there have been some studies that have sort of developed methods for doing that, um, essentially detection and monitoring um, of the efficacy of treatments. Um, but there haven't there hasn't been sort of like a ground truthing yet, um, where you know, say there is some mapping done and then that is followed up with on the ground, kind of how well did it match up with um, what the remote sensing and the drone mapping, uh, you know, found. So that is kind of the one of the goals of this current work that we're just beginning. I have my suspicions and I'm a little concerned that um, using aerial imaging or remote sensing would be more useful for large patches than for small patches. And of course, we we would be concerned with catching the small ca smaller patches too, because the smaller they are, the easier they are to treat. So both physically and in the amount of treatments that they require is less. So if we can catch them small. So um, if the remote sensing weren't, it, it remains to be seen if the remote sensing will work to capture and identify smaller patches. Right. Okay, next question um, is about glyphosate. So are there any concerns beyond the norm about glyphosate leaching or otherwise making its way into water during control treatments? Um, or is the bulk of it hopefully taken up by the Phragmites, um, given how well it likes to uptake water? Uh, beyond the norm, I would say no. Um, but obviously we're very concerned about like the potential for non-target impacts. Um, we actually have mostly been using a Mazapir, um, our contractors have. Um, so yeah, it's sort of situation specific again, where they might choose one herbicide over the other. Um, yeah, I guess I would say not beyond the norm. Um, anything to add, Julia? Yeah, we're, we obviously are using aquatic formulated herbicide products, and that's what all of the contractors would be using. Um, they are likely mixing that just um, by default because, you know, if they've got a tank and they're treating something in a roadside and then next going to a wetland, they're going to be using an aquatic formulated product. And so um, we, we generally have concerns about using herbicides like a lot of people do. We don't want to overuse them. And that's why on our website, we have that specific protocol where we're treating the phragmites one time per year, and then we wait patiently one time per year at the optimal time to have, you know, an effect. And then we wait patiently until following year, do the monitoring and determine if we need a follow-up treatment. And I think that's one of the ways that we're being really responsible with chemical use. All right. So how do the two of you think that Minnesota is doing compared to other states? Do we have more? Are we correcting faster? What are your thoughts? Yeah, we, I, well, we got, we caught it early. Um, that's, that's the hopeful thing here. And that's been to our advantage. So, um, you know, like, like I said, there's other states, some of those other ones I mentioned out East um, are, have, it's just out of control. Um, and it's really taken over a lot of just vast areas. Um, like Green Bay is always kind of what I point to. Like if you've been in Eastern Wisconsin, like you've seen this plant um, everywhere. <laughs> um, so it's really unfortunate, um, you know, uh, but there, even again, Wisconsin is doing a great job of trying to keep it from moving westward even in Wisconsin. They actually have a split regulatory status um, where uh, it essentially has a more severe kind of regulations in the western half of the state. Um, so yeah, um, we're, we think, again, like I said, we think we can continue to reverse the spread in a lot of parts of the state um, and just really hopefully keep it in check as long as we are um, keeping everything up that's been going on. So uh, that's, yeah, it's, a, it's encouraging and I'm excited um that you know just this i mean this whole effort just is a is a hopeful example of uh you know landscape scale invasive species invasive species management so i could add that i don't think we'll have funding forever um so part of what we're doing is definitely trying to do um programs like this where we're reaching out and hopefully we're reaching out to some of the right people within this um webinar but in then other um conversations that we're having with um county staff state staff um 
managers that are managing the lands that where Phragmites is showing up. But we hope that we just increase awareness. And so that if at some day we don't have the statewide control program, that the control is delegated then out to the individual counties or municipalities, et cetera, that could then take over the control. But I think we're, we're making a good start at it. And um, we'll just, as Chelsea said, the persistence of um, management effort over time is what will be um, key to keeping it under control. It's always great to have happy answers to invasive species questions. <laughs> Okay, um, the next slide was wondering about if you happen to have a copy of your slides that might be available for public use. And I will note that we are recording the webinar as well. So I know it's not an actual slide deck, but you will have access to viewing all of the slides at the very least on our YouTube channel. But I'll leave the rest to you and, you and Chelsea. Yeah, I can definitely provide the slides. Um, I intentionally didn't put a lot of words on the slides. So yeah, maybe the recording will be kind of your better resource. Um, but yeah, we can definitely label the native and non-native on the slide deck. And I really, I would just suggest though, going to the website for those, those same images are, are on the website. And so it's all pretty well spelled out there as well. So, yep. Great. All right. Uh, maybe a testament to recent weather events in the area, um, there's a question that maybe Chelsea, you answered about already about spread, um, but they're wondering about tornadoes as a risk for spread as well. Oh my gosh, I had never thought about that before. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> um, yeah, I I don't know how seed moves around in a tornado. Um, I, I imagine think that could be a risk. The bulk of tornado season wouldn't be at a time when there's ripe seed on the viable seed okay. on the plants largely yeah um so you know like the seed isn't going to ripen until late october early november and we could still have a tornado then then it might be a risk but this time of the year um any of the standing populations most of their seed blew off in the winter time so it's winter winds that are a bigger risk i think than a tornado Got it. all right That's a really uh, <laughs> yes <laughs> Um, someone knows that they've seen this along railroad tracks as well, and we're wondering about how partnerships with railroad companies on right-of-ways might work for treatments and management. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, we've been working really hard to uh, get relationships with the railroads, and it's taken a couple years, um, but most of them, um, there's, there's four big ones um, that we work with, and Basically two of them are just kind of like, let us know when you're gonna be there and our contractor can come take care of it. Um, BNSF has um, basically, they have their own weed management contractors. So they have agreed to start taking on the treatments on along their right of ways. Um, and then there's one other big one that um, has at least one big population that we're really wanting to get treated. Um, and we are still working on that one. So um, mostly it's been going really well. Um, but yeah, we it has been a bit of a challenge to just kind of find the right people and communicate, you know, that it is a regulated species. Um, and, you know, it uh, if we are lucky to have this funding, um, but landowners are obligated to work toward preventing the spread. So um, yeah, it's a work in progress. Okay, so then beyond the lateral spreading rhizomes, how deep does the root system go? And is that something that has to be worried about for like digging out during management? Uh, we actually did have to dig some rhizomes for the research project that Chelsea described. And we were down a good two feet. And I think they could go another one to two feet easy in, a, in the right substrate, you know, like a good wetland soil. Um, I don't know that for sure. But we know that in the wastewater treatment facilities, when they dig out the biosolids, um, so the biosolids can get as much as four feet deep. And the, the rhizomes definitely go through the whole depth of the biosolids and then into the sand layer below, which is another foot. So they probably can exceed five feet. I wouldn't be surprised. Wow. They're very robust. <laughs> and that's, that's why we're using a MAZAP here. 
because the imazapyr has a longer residual. So when you spray down the foliage, it translocates through the foliage down into the rhizomes, and then it sits in the rhizomes for a period of a few months. And we think that gives us a slight edge potentially over glyphosate, which is also effective, but you know, we're looking for any edge we can get. Yeah. All right. Um, so have there been any lessons learned or impacts from the states that have been heavily infested um, to help convey the importance of the issue in Minnesota or any other notable connections with, with those states? Yeah, I'll let you, I don't know. We, um, yeah. mm -hmm. we haven't worked very, very closely with other states. Um, we know that some states like Iowa, we, we hear that, you know, nothing's really going on down there. Wisconsin's um, getting, they just received some funding to do more control in the West part of the state, but in fact, only part of the, the, the area they've divided up into different regions. Um, so nobody else to our knowledge has a comprehensive statewide program like we have. Um, we wish they would, especially surrounding states, obviously, because that's going to be always a continuing source of spread if other states are um, not treating their phragmites. Um, we see it along the interstates and we know that mowing moves it. So, you know, you can envision that coming over a border at some point um, just because it's adjacent. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a concern if other states aren't. But I think that, you know, largely we have the funding and we're going to protect our own territory as much as we can. We've tried, we actually did try to, um, we applied for some interjurisdictional funding and we didn't get it, but um, you know, that was an effort to kind of communicate across borders and encourage, you know, more action over there. But, um, you know, we don't have entirely control over that. So we're controlling what we can control. Yeah, and we have had some of the interjurisdictional GLRI funding before to work on with the some of the work on the wastewater treatment facilities. Um, and we have been in touch with all of like neighboring states and a lot of the states in the Great Lakes region um, through that. So um, that was, again, mostly focused on the wastewater treatment facilities. Um, and yeah, I guess that you know, we, we are in touch and we most most closely, I would say, work with Wisconsin. Um, you know, being kind of the, having that kind of invasion front there. Um, and we've even worked with Ontario um, as well, so. Great. Okay, I suspect this might be the last question we have time to get to, um, and I'm gonna maybe add my own piece onto it. So the first part of the question was wondering about what some of the challenge are, challenges have been to treating new infestations on private property. But then I was also wondering if you can add maybe some of the steps you've been able to take to address those. Yeah, we have had amazing luck, I would say, um, or just people that are amenable to having this work done on their private property for the vast majority of landowners that we work with. Um, just honestly sign our like permission form and we never hear from them otherwise. So people realize this is an issue, um, which is amazing. Um, thanks to any landowners who are on the call. Um, we, you know, we do have a few that are concerned about herbicide use, understandably, or just we don't hear from for whatever reason. Um, sometimes I feel like it's a little bit more challenging if it's like a maybe owned by a company or business or something and like it's a larger business and you don't know who you're even reaching out to necessarily um so that can be kind of a challenge but for the most part we've had pretty good good connections anything to add julia no i would say that's right yeah we we feel really lucky to have really engaged um citizens in minnesota um i think partly due to programs like yours um that get a lot of press and people are aware that Broadly, there are invasive species issues that they need to be aware of and they can help prevent. Um, so we've had, you know, great success having cooperation from the landowners. That's great. Thanks so much to both of you. I'm going to um, put up the screen share again and the final closing remarks in. It's been so great to hear the updates on this project from where it was five years ago during the first time when it was just a discussion of a potential framework to doing this, to seeing all the work you've done to actually do it. It's been wonderful. So thank you for joining us. Um, for those on the webinar, thanks to all of you for joining and listening in on the webinar. Um, we will work on getting this recording up. 
Um, and you can catch it on our YouTube channel at z.umn.edu slash AISTube. Um, we'll also send out a follow-up email with a link once that's posted. Um, give us a week or so to, to get all the closed captioning and everything done. And we'll try to add in, um, you know, so you can see the poll results and any other um, post edit or post post editing needed. Um, we also have a survey that I think you'll get a link to once you close out. And we greatly appreciate you taking the time to fill this out and um, tell us about your thoughts of this webinar and the series in general. I do also have emails showing. So if you did have follow-up questions um, for Chelsea and Julia, um, Chelsea, I'm sorry, it's just yours that I have there. So you're, you'll Greg you'll Mighty's, Greg Mighty's <laughs> at umn.edu. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yes. You, so, yeah. you can also get the team. So Chelsea's is showing and then the, the, you can catch the whole team at fragmighties at umn.edu. Um, if you have questions for us as the webinar series hosts, um, you can reach out to us at AISdetectors at umn.edu. And um, that's all that we have for you today. So um, thanks for joining us. We hope you will catch us for our next webinar, which is in two months. Um, and it's about um, starry stonewort occupancy modeling. So we hope to see you then as well. And thanks again to Chelsea and Julia. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone.